Our first speaker is um, Sherry O'Sullivan with uh, Florida Concrete Fiber. Sherry uh, is uh, been has uh, with has more than 18 years experience in the concrete industry, uh, focusing on concrete materials and concrete pavements. Uh, Sherry collaborates with key decision makers to provide competitive concrete paving alternates and to improve long-term pavement performance. Using a consultative approach, she'll work with you to provide the most optimized and competitive pavement alternatives for each specified project. She has uh, experience with all types of concrete pavement applications, including full depth concrete pavements, concrete overlays, thin concrete pavements, and roller compacted concrete pavements. Prior to joining Forda, Sherry served as the National Account Manager and Senior Sales Engineer with PNA Construction Technologies. Director of Transportation for the Cement Association of Canada and has held roles in both private and public sectors throughout her career. Sherry holds both bachelor and master's degrees in civil engineering from Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada, and she is a certified professional engineer, lead accredited professional, and an active member of several associations, including the American Concrete Pavement Association, Transportation Research Board, American Concrete Institute, uh, and American Society of Concrete Contractors and the Transportation Association of Canada. And with that, I will turn it over to Sherry. Thanks, Rick. All right. Thank you, um, everyone, for joining this morning. Um, I'm going to be talking to you about optimized concrete pavement designs and specifically a newer technology to North America um, called TCP, Thin Concrete Pavement. But before I get into that um, specifically, I'm going to take you through um, sort of an uh, history of pavement design and evolution of concrete pavement design, and then get into, um, you know, TCP specifically in a little bit. But before I get started, I'm just going to go over a quick little overview on, you know, why, um, you know, the value proposition of TCP and let you know a little bit more about that. So it stands for thin concrete pavement, which is a short slab design. Um, you may have seen it um, listed elsewhere as short slabs. Um, and it's in North America as a proprietary design build solution that will provide the least cost concrete paving alternate. And it will compete um, on first cost with asphalt pavement um, in most cases as well. Um, but what I'm going to show you throughout this presentation is that it's also lower risk. We're using an advanced engineering method of designing these pavements um, with more than 18 years of performance globally. Um, and I'm also going to show you how it contributes to um, a more sustainable paving solution as well. Um, some of the clients that are already using this system um, across North America and South America as well, um, I'm sure you recognize some of these names. Um, we've done a lot of work now with Home Depot and Prologis, um, also with the U.S. Army and Air Force, um, and a lot of other names I'm sure that you're familiar with that have been already using this technology. Um, some of the reasons why um, are because of the significant cost savings um, is what really gets people initially interested. A um, couple of examples from North America, a project that was 2.7 million square feet of industrial paving. They were able to save $2.4 million over what they would have traditionally done um, with another concrete pavement design. And when um, we did a project in the Northeast um, comparing to a traditional asphalt design, it was a 1.6 million square foot industrial facility that saved the owner $1 million. Um, so these are actual project savings in different parts of the country um, where we were able to, you know, save a significant amount of money for the owners, but also provide a much better performing concrete pavement at the same time. Um, it needs to be paved um, using an authorized um, concrete contractor. Um, there's concrete contractors um, all over North America now um, that are able to pave this both with national and regional coverage. And now I'm just going to get into the development. So. There was a lot of people involved in the history and the development of this technology, and I like to give credit where credit's due. So I'm going to take you through um, the involvement um, of each of these people and how they were involved in the development of this system. The first is um, Jerry Holland, who was really a catalyst of the technology. He's known as a guru um, in concrete curling um, for both slabs and pavements. He's written lots of articles, um, contributed to a lot of specifications, um, specifically on concrete curling. 
And when Juan Pablo Covarrubia Sr., um, who at the time was the manager of the Cement and Concrete Association of Chile, um, they were having some very significant issues with their concrete pavements due to the amount of curling that they were getting down there. They have some of the worst curling in the world in Chile. Both Jerry Holland and Mike Darter, who is um, also known as a concrete um, expert as well, went down to help Juan Pablo with the issues he was having and figure out, um, you know, some solutions to help them with that. Um, Lev Kostanovich, um, who is now with the University of Pittsburgh, um, did his PhD at the University of Illinois and developed a tool called ISLAB. ISLAB is a finite element analysis method of, of looking at, um, you know, how loads are being analyzed in both pavements and slabs. And it actually is the structural basis for both MEPDG, which is what um, the federal government's using, um, Ashtoware Pavement ME is another design method, as well as OptiPave, which is the tool that um, we use for designing thin concrete pavements as well. So, and I'll explain later on sort of the, the similarities and differences between those two programs. Juan Pablo Covarrubias Jr., who um, is the general manager of TC Pavements. Um, he's also a professor at the University of Los Andes in Chile. Um, he's the developer of OptiPave, and he worked with Lev Kostanovich to include his models in this tool um, to provide a design tool um, that considers short joint spacing. Jeff Raisler at the University of Illinois um, did all of the physical testing to calibrate the software and um, I'm going to be explaining these tests um, in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. And Dr. Dan Zolliger with Texas A&M University, um, he was the person that developed the load transfer models for both MEPDG as well as OptiPave. So these are the really smart guys involved in um, the modeling and the background and the development of what we're talking about today. Now I'm going to get into the history of concrete pavement design and technical support. If, you, if you've ever been involved in the design of concrete pavements for industrial tr and trucking facilities, you'll remember um, back before this, this document here, ACI 332R-17 was released, we didn't have really any guidance to point people to or, to or any resources really to support us in the design of the pavements at these facilities. And so what we had to do was um, piece together information from... Um, the streets and roads and highways area, you know, through ACPA as well as DOT specifications, sometimes through FHWA. Um, when we got into really heavy loads, we may had to look at um, airport pavement design tools, um, potentially even getting into some of the specifications from the floor slab area because of the small hard wheels maybe that would be on the pavements. But we didn't really have any tools specifically for industrial and commercial paving. Um, it took 12 years to develop this guide, but it's been, um, you know, really helpful for pointing people in the right direction on designing specifically pavements for um, this type of facility. And I'm gonna, what I'm going to be talking about today is um, a lot of the different um, aspects in this guide. What was great was it actually started to include the different type of loading that, um, you know, we see at these types of facilities. So it looked, it considered standard trucks, which we see at a lot of, you know, just typical distribution centers, but also industrial lift trucks, front end loaders. Um, it got into cranes. Um, we can now look at different types of military equipment, um, buses and coaches, and also agricultural equipment. And that was one of the reasons why it took so long to develop this guide was we, you know, initially started looking at standard trucks, but then, you know, you really, really realized that these facilities could have all sorts of types of traffic. And so we needed to consider that. Some of the best um, information that I find in this document is the consideration of a holistic design, because previously we may have had, um, you know, the civil engineer being involved in some parts where they're, you know, recommending you know, a design life and um, the geotech maybe would be providing a thickness design. The joint spacing may have been left up to the contractor and they may not all have been communicating. So it's really important um, and it's listed in this guide to make sure that all of the parties that are involved in the design of the pavement work together. Um, it's done in a holistic way. You shouldn't be considering any of these independently. Um, especially when it comes to thickness and joint spacing, they should not be considered independently. Um, and it's really important also to look at the aspects of curling and warping and load transfer, which some of our older design theories did not consider. This guide also, you'll notice, um, does not 
one of the biggest things actually in this guide, as well as the, um, the newer released ACI 330 for commercial parking lots, is that AASHTO 93 is no longer listed as an appropriate way of designing these types of pavements. What we found was that AASHTO 93 could be very conservative in some cases, but in some cases it could have been um, slightly under conservative. And so the tables that are in this document were developed using ACPA Street Pave, and it also lists three other tools for optimizing your concrete pavement design. So if you want to go a little bit further in optimization, you can use Ashtoware's Pavement ME, or you can use TC Pavement's OptiPave, which is what I was talking about for the design of TC, TCP pavements. Um, and then if you get into some different loads where they're not considered um, in here, you may have to still use AirPave to analyze those. This here is showing the evolution of concrete pavement design. Um, for many years, if you have been involved in the design of concrete pavements, I'm sure you used Ashto 93 at some point. That was really all we had for providing concrete pavement designs for a very long time. There was a 40 year divide before we had anything better. Um, the Portland Cement Association came up with some tables that we used for a little while that then got developed into street pave and now um, known as pavementdesigner.org. Um, this is a huge improvement over what we had been doing with Ashto 93, um, but there is still some limitations in this design method, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit here. If you want to do an optimized concrete pavement design using a mechanistic empirical approach, um, there's really only two design methods available to do that, and that would be with Ashto Wears Pavement ME um, and TC Pavements OptiPave. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more here in a minute. Before I get into that, I'm going to talk about the theory behind um, TCP, thin concrete pavements, and how the system works. And it's rooted in curling. Um, so all concrete pavements are going to curl. I was talking about Jerry Holland and all of the work that he's done with concrete curling. He's documented it very well. Um, if you have worked in slabs and concrete pavements, I'm sure you've seen curling at some point. Um, there's different products and things we can do to the concrete to make it maybe curl less, but we can never completely eliminate it. And we definitely should not be ignoring it. Um, we've known about curl for more than 50 years. But the reality is we didn't have the tools um, that could help us model curling. And so traditional slab on ground theories, what they did was they assumed that concrete was always in full contact with the base. In reality, we have evaporation of water. We have a temperature gradient between the top and the bottom of that slab. And those edges are going to want to curl up and they're no longer supported. So we knew this was happening, but we didn't have the right tools to model the situation. Um, but now we do. Further to that, when you look at an industrial facility um, and the spacing of the joints that we were using, we were using, you know, most of the time now we're using a 15 foot joint spacing. And at an industrial facility, what that means is that we're also going to be loading the front and the back of the panel, because if you look at a standard over the road tractor trailer, the distance between the first and second axle is also about 15 feet. And so now we have these curled edges that are not supported, and we're going to be providing a load on the front and back of that panel, which is going to want to induce a top down crack in the middle of that panel. If you um, think of a dinner plate analogy, that's why I have this over here. Um, if you were going to try and break that plate, you would need to put pressure on both sides of that plate to break the panel. But if you were to remove one of your hands, um, that plate's just going to rock. You're not going to be able to break it. And so think about that when I get into this next slide. Curling. This, this top right picture is showing a, a very exaggerated curled panel. And the reason I'm showing this is because curling is not a linear relationship. So just by modifying your joint spacing, so if we were to cut this panel in half, we're actually going to get about one fifth of the curl. So just by modifying joint spacing and doing nothing else, we can significantly reduce the stresses in a concrete pavement um, but to one fifth of what we previously had. Then if you look at how those loads are actually being carried on the panels as well. And so this top left is showing a conventional design, um, which is 10 inches thick with 12 by 15 foot panels. Um, again, we're in that condition where we're loading the front and back of the panel. 
we have unsupported edges. Um, so that's why we've had to pave it a lot thicker. In this case, it's 10 inches thick. With a TCP design, what we do is we make sure that um, we're only loading one panel or sorry, a panel with one wheel per time. And if we have a double axle, we would be loading the front and middle of the panel or the middle and back of the panel. But what we do in a TCP design is we um, try to eliminate the situation of loading front and back of the panel at the same time. And so because of the shorter joint spacing and having significantly less curling, as well as how we're loading that pavement, we've significantly reduced the amount of stresses in each of these individual slabs. And so we are now able to reduce thickness in this case down to six and a half inches. There was a paper that um, we published um, a while back um, that showed the value of joint spacing and reducing thickness. And this was kind of the first time where we were able to plot this type of graph because we had a tool that we could um, actually design for short joint spacing. And so if you look at this um, graph, I was explaining that Ashdor Pavement ME and OptiPave had those same sort of core models in, in it from iSlab. One of the fundamental differences between the tools is the boundary conditions of how you use those tools. And so the limit um, of using Ashdor Pavement ME or even pavementdesigner.org is to a 10 foot joint spacing. If you try to do less than a 10 foot joint spacing with either of these tools, it's outside of the limits of those models. Um, with OptiPave, the limits of the models are between five and eight foot joint spacing. And so it was specifically created um, for looking at short slab pavement designs. And if you look at this graph, you can really see the value of reducing thickness um, and the relationship between joint spacing and thickness. So if we were at previously a 15 foot joint spacing, we're up here at almost nine inches. Um, and as we reduce joint spacing, we also reduce thickness. Here's an example um, where we were running all of the same inputs through all of the different design tools to show what the different designs would look like, different design recommendations. Um, and this is in a free spa climate in the Chicago, Illinois area. Um, it was a facility with 500 trucks a day um, in a free slot climate. Um, we assumed positive load transfer at all the joints, and it was in a low support condition. Um, when we used Ashto 93 and a 15 foot joint spacing, we were at nine inches thick. Um, we would need to have dowels at all of those contraction joints to get positive load transfer, and we would have to seal all of those joints. Um, using either street pave or Ashtoware pavement ME with a 12 foot joint spacing, we were able to reduce thickness to seven and a half inches. Again, we needed to have dowels at all of those contraction joints um, and we had to seal all of those joints as well. Using OptiPave um, and the TCP system, we reduced our joint spacing to six foot, sorry, six foot joints. Um, and we were able to reduce thickness to five inches. There's no dowels um, at the contraction joints and the joints are left unsealed. Um, so, oh, and it has um, four pounds per cubic yard of um, macro synthetic fiber as well. The reason why the joints aren't sealed is because um, the system has a very thin saw cut joint. So this is showing the two different um, saw cuts. Typically you would see a one eighth of an inch saw cut blade, which looks like this one right here. Um, in the TCP system, um, it's a six foot joint with a very thin saw cut blade. So they're using a 12th of an inch saw cut blade, um, whether it's with um, early entry or wet cut, um, both blades are available. These are the um, details from the ACI 332R-17 document. If you're using um, an early entry saw, it's very important to note that it has not only a minimum saw cut depth, but also a maximum saw cut depth. So because um, we're not using any dowels in the system, um, we are relying on aggregate interlock, which is very effective as long as you don't cut through those aggregates um, that we need for that aggregate interlock to provide jo joint load transfer. Um, in a conventional sawing um, system, we would be looking at D over four to D over three and with an early entry saw D over six to D over five. Here's an example of um, one of the plans from a spec building that we did 
just to show you some of the details um, that we um, recommend. Um, there's a couple of exceptions to dowels. One would be where we're tying into an existing slab and transitioning to um, the thinner thickness. Um, we would be using a square dowel and clip at this situation. And then at construction joints, um, we do recommend the use of a diamond dowel. Here's some examples of um, the joint layout plans that we um, provide. It's really important um, when I was talking about the holistic design, I think one of the things that may have been missing from that was also knowing how the pavement is going to be constructed when you're doing the design as well because your joint layout plan will change depending on if you're using a slip form paver versus a 3D laser screed. And so this is an example of a curve. Um, this is a fire route around a building where it was paved using a 3D laser screed. And so you wanna do square joints because you can't saw cut around a corner. Um, so you would have to do these square jointing patterns with dog legs um, into the corners to make sure that we're not gonna get any sympathetic cracking. Um, if you used a slip form paver around this corner, then we would have joints that, um, that would be curved around, around this corner. Something else to um, look at is if we have T-joints where we're meeting up to, um, in this, this situation here, this is not a TC pavement project. I'm just showing you what could happen um, if we didn't do this detail. But what we do um, in this situation is where you're cutting up to an existing pavement that has a different jointing pattern. We have a T-joint. You can't actually get right to... Um, right to that joint. And so what we do is a very thin drill hole, um, which stops this from happening. So you don't have um, the crack going into the, the next panel. And that seems to work really well. So that's just some of the details and the history of how that works. Um, now I'm gonna talk about the accelerated load testing that we um, did at the University of Illinois. So um, this is at the University of Illinois test track where they um, removed a lane, they put down a geotextile and some granular material. They paved um, the concrete, the thickness ranged between three inches and eight inches. Um, one lane was fiber reinforced and one was not fiber reinforced. They took this machine called an Atlas testing machine um, that has a very heavily pressurized um, airplane tire that goes back and forth along the edge of the pavement, the mid panel of the pavement and the edge of the joint until failure. Here's a close up of what that looks like. And this is what it looked like at the end of the testing. And so you can see um, one section here actually didn't fail. They weren't able to fail a certain part of the um, pavement. And this is showing the value of the macrosynthetic fiber reinforcement. The only difference between these two panels, they're both eight inches thick, um, is this one did not have the fiber reinforcement and this one did. And so in the system, um, you know, the fibers are really effective at holding those um, bottom up cracks really tight together. So we don't have the failure at the surface. Now I'm gonna get into some case studies and show you where, um, where the technology has been used um, both in North and South America. But I'm gonna start in South America because that's where this technology originated from in Chile and they have a lot of um, experience. They've been using it for almost 20 years. Um, there's this great website, which is an explorer. All of these little dots are projects that you can look at. They have photographs, they um, show what the design was and how it's been performing. Um, it's had a very significant impact on their market share. Um, the highway sector, I find this one really impressive because they, you know, maybe only had 10% concrete pavements before the implementation of TCP. Um, the federal government um, in Chile now um, only allows either TCP for concrete or asphalt pavements. Um, and so 35% of their highway network is now paved with TCP pavements. Um, and in the industrial sector, they have about a 75% market share now. 
Um, in North America, when we were first um, starting to promote, um, we worked with um, McGregor Associates Architects. Um, we provided a presentation like this to them and we went down to Chile with them. And I'm gonna show you a few of the projects that we visited when we were down there. The first was a Walmart um, that was constructed in uh, 2011. This project is six inches thick with a six foot joint spacing and it is placed on a six inch granular base. Um, it was designed for 500 trucks a day over a 20 year design life. Um, and it's just outside of Santiago, Chile. Um, and this first project was 600,000 square feet. These are photos that I took back in 2019. At this point, it was 10 years old. Um, this is the main entrance to the facility. Right here is the end of the access road. This is the access road. You can see all the trucks lined up um, to enter the facility. Um, so they go across here, turn into the facility, and then they drive out. So this is the most heavily trafficked part of the entire facility. Um, at 10 years, there's still no cracking and Walmart's very happy with how it's performing. Um, they were able to save 12% on this project over what they would have traditionally used as the design. Walmart um, did, they were so happy with how that was performing that in 2018, when they were building this much larger facility, um, which had 1.5 million square feet of paving, they also chose TCP, um, the access road, um, the entire truck court, all of the loading docks, as well as this employee parking lot are all paved um, using the TCP technology. The very first um, user in an industrial space of TCP was Sodamac back in 2008. Um, this project is uh, five and a half inches thick with a six foot joint spacing on a six inch granular base. Again, it was designed for 500 trucks a day over a 20 year design life, um, just outside of Santiago, Chile, and it was 500,000 square feet. These are photos that I took of the main entrance as well as the exit um, at 12 years. There's um, still no cracking evident and um, Sodamac is very happy with how it's been performing. Their uh, traditional design would have been an eight inch reinforced concrete pavement. Um, they were able to reduce to five and a half inches with fiber reinforcement and reduce Sodomax costs by 20%. I'm gonna show one highway example, um, just because of how impressed I was with this project when we drove on it. Um, one of the things I haven't talked about is user comfort. And um, when you have a fifth of the amount of curl, you actually feel that. So I know most people, when they drive over a concrete pavement, you feel every joint that you drive over. With this system, it actually feels more like a newly paved asphalt pavement. You don't feel the joints. It was one of the smoothest pavements I've ever driven on. This is a very heavily trafficked highway that connects their wet port to their dry port. Um, and it's 189 million easels. So the projects I just showed you were for 500 trucks a day over a 20 year design life, and that equated to 10 million easels. So this is 189 million easels. So significantly more traffic than what we were seeing at those industrial facilities, um, which is why you'll see that it's a lot thicker. It's nine inches thick um, with a six foot joint spacing. This was constructed in 2016. Um, you can see it, um, it, it's a, a quite a long highway. It connects their wet port here to their dry port inland. And um, these are the actual bid um, numbers for that project. Um, so they allowed asphalt, traditional concrete and TCP bids. Um, they were able to um, save 41% over the asphalt payment design. This is just um, the cost savings on first cost. Um, we were also told they were able to pave it in about half the amount of time. Um, because if you can imagine, we were at nine inches of TCP, they would have a lot of lifts of asphalt required, which would take a lot more time as well. So those are some South American projects. Um, I know I'm getting um, tight on time here, so I'm going to get into North America and then into some of the sustainability before I can take some of your questions. The first user in an industrial facility in North America was with... Um, Aldi, and this is a facility just outside of Richmond, Virginia, um, in Dinwiddie County. Um, where I'm standing here is five and a half inches thick on a six inch granular base with a six foot joint spacing. This was a facility where we did a mixture of design um, methods. So this area was done with TCP as well as the fire route around the building. 
um, which were those photos I showed earlier. Um, and it meets up to a traditionally designed um, using street paved design at the back of this facility, which is why we had all of those T joints because we went from a six foot joint spacing to a 12 foot joint spacing. Um, but this facility is performing really well and Aldi now um, is continuing to, to consider it for additional facilities. One of the first contractors that um, used this technology was the Fricks Company. Um, they had been doing some work down in South America and saw the technology. Um, they've you know, done a bunch of the projects I'll be talking about today, but they also um, did their own um, pallet recycling facility in Fort Worth, Texas in 2017. You can see it has just standard over the road trucks. Um, this one is four inches thick on a six inch granular base with a six foot joint spacing. Um, constructed in 2017, still performing really well. Um, United States Cold Storage um, constructed this in 2019 outside of Atlanta, Georgia. It's five and a half inches thick with a five foot joint spacing on a four inch granular base, um, designed for 250 trucks a day over a 50 year design period, which is a slightly different design than we've done for other owners. Um, it's performing really well. There's been um, at least two, I think, expansions at this facility already. And I know U.S. Cold is planning additional sites as well. Prologis, we've done a lot of projects with Prologis and um, we're now written in their national specification as well. Um, this one here in Lockport, Illinois, was done in 2020. Um, it's six inches thick on a six inch granular base with a six foot joint spacing. I like to show these pictures to um, explain some of the construction of the of these projects as well. You can see this one had a six inch granular base. Um, so they were truck dumping and using a 3D laser screed. Um, some of the other ones I'm gonna show you were more um, stabilized and had to use a pump. This one here is in Nashville, Tennessee. It was more recently constructed in 2011 or 2021. And you can see now um, them getting on with the saw cutting and what that would look like and forming the construction joints here. Some examples with um, stabilized bases. This one is down in Baytown, Texas, constructed in 2020. Um, this is a spec building with a Mariport. Um, it's an industrial park. They um, used a six inch lime stabilized base with five and a half inches of TCP on top of that. You can see they're pumping the concrete into place. You can see the diamond dowels along the construction joint here. It's performing really well. It was 200,000 square feet, this one. Um, and that same contractor, um, did this much larger facility, which is in Houston, Texas, um, 2.7 million square feet of, of paving on this job. Um, this is one that we saved $2.4 million. It's on a eight inch cement stabilized base. You can see the pump here, pumping it into place. Um, this is the roller rolling out the cement treated base. And um, they've done a couple of expansions already at this facility as well. So those are some examples of where we have used it in both South and North America. Now I'm just going to quickly talk about sustainability um, and, you know, what, how TCP can contribute to that. Um, so it, I'm sure you've seen now, you know, TCP is an innovative design that demonstrates economic value, reduced environmental impact and reduced social impact. And the reason um, that we're reducing the environmental impact, these are just some things to think about. We're using about 30 to 40% less concrete um, in these systems. We've eliminated um, steel reinforcement um, and most of the dowels. We have just a handful of dowels at construction joints generally. It provides more flexible maintenance. And so we have smaller slabs to replace um, when, when required. And also in a municipal setting, it would be better to accommodate utility repairs, similar to if you were looking at repairing um, interlocking concrete pavers. Um, there's been good performance and we have better improved end of life options because of the extended life of these systems. I'm going to talk quickly about a case study that we did um, to look at the life, cy life cycle impact with um, Manitoba infrastructure, which is the Department of Transportation in Manitoba, Canada. Um, this was back when I was the director of transportation with the cement association. Um, I worked with a lot of Ahmed from the Manitoba infrastructure engineering department. We worked with the team at Athena sustainable materials Institute out of Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. Um, and with Mediac Berrien, um, who at the time was with the MIT concrete sustainability hub out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. So that's who the authors of these paper that I'm going to talk about quickly. What we looked at um, was currently what Manitoba infrastructure was 
um, using for their concrete pavement designs. Um, we analyzed an 11 kilometer stretch with two lanes and shoulders. And we looked at 10 different concrete pavement alternates um, and evaluated them both with an economic LCCA, so life cycle cost analysis, as well as an environmental life cycle assessment. We looked at different things like um, the concrete mixture, the design itself, different maintenance and rehabilitation strategies. Um, and we compared that to their business as usual base case um, over a 50 year analysis period. Here's a summary of the 10 different alternates that we looked at. Um, so some of the things we looked at were reducing the total cementitious content in um, the system, not just through adding supplementary cementing materials, which is one of the things we did do, um, but also through um, aggregate optimization and um, looking at reducing the steel. So they were using dowels for their load transfer. So looking at just using dowels in the wheel path versus across the entire joint. Um, we also looked at using ternary mixes, so cement with fly ash and slag, um, and then also that um, the tarantula curve aggregate gradation, which I'm going to show you on the next slide. And then um, the last thing we looked at was the effect of short panel concrete, so TCP. Um, so case nine and 10, I'm going to be the ones that I'm going to be pointing out the most. Um, so case number nine is just TCP. And then case number 10 is looking at reduced cementitious TCP um, and having an extended maintenance cycle, maintenance and rehabilitation cycle. And so the thickness reduction in this case was uh, from 10 inches down to seven and a half inches. This is showing um, the tarantula curve. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this. Um, this is um, Tyler Lay from Oklahoma State University came up with this this curve to provide um, more optimized aggregate gradations. And so one of the things that we looked at, um, this is their um, aggregate gradation prior to 2015. Um, and then also adding in that intermediate aggregate now um, and fitting in that tarantula curve. So they have a much um, better aggregate gradation, which allowed for a reduction in cement content. This is showing the summary of the net present value of all of the alternatives when we did our life cycle cost analysis. So you can see for case number nine, which was just doing TCP alone and nothing else, there was an 11% um, net present value. And when we also included some of the impacts of modifying the mix design and the maintenance schedule, we are able to reduce further to 18%. And then from an environmental perspective, um, the variations in greenhouse gas emissions are shown here. For case nine, the total life cycle, so it, show, it breaks it down when you do a life cycle assessment using the Athena impact estimator, which is now called the pavement LCA tool. If you're not familiar with it, um, it's a great life cycle assessment tool, free to use, um, that breaks it down from manufacturing, construction, maintenance, the embodied energy, it also looks at PVI, which is the pavement vehicle interaction, the work done at um, MIT Concrete Sustainability Hub, and then the total life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. So you can see just by using TCP, we had um, a 6.2% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And by modifying um, the materials as well, we were able to get close to 16% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. So the summary of that research, before I get into the summary of the whole presentation, you know, was that government can really have a, a huge impact on reduction just by making very small changes in the way that they um, are, are doing their business, um, you know, in the way that they're designing their pavements, in um, the way that they're, you know, tendering their, their bids as well. They can have a huge impact um, just by making very small changes. That's sort of what the result was of that research. But to summarize my whole presentation, um, I just want to go over a quick comparison between, you know, what the differences are between what we have traditionally been doing and what a thin concrete pavement is. And so the main difference is obviously the joint spacing. And so this is a short slab design system where we're looking at joints between five and eight foot. Um, traditionally, we would have been between 12 and 15 foot. There's no rebar, no steel. Um, dowels are only at construction joints. Um, there's a minimum and a maximum saw cut depth. The joints are left unsealed. Um, it's going to be less expensive. Uh, we'll have a smoother surface, which I was talking about, you know, when I was driving on the highway, you can really feel that. 
Um, but most importantly is it's a very advanced way of, of analyzing and looking at concrete pavement design. It's using a mechanistic empirical approach. Um, we're using finite element analysis to analyze loads that um, are not included in some of these systems. And so we're really able to predict long-term performance like we haven't been able to do previously. So Rick, I think I was um, pretty much bang on there, um, 45 minutes. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions that anyone has in the chat box. Sure. And, um, um, but the, the first question is, uh, comes from uh, Wilbur Bragg. It um, says one of the uh, Chilean cases, case studies seem to show rectangular slab panels. What aspect ratios are typically desired? Mm, I know the project he's talking about, um, and it was on the edge of the, here, let me go back actually, so I can show that. Cause I believe it's this one. He's probably talking about this right here. Um, so these, I had actually the same question. Um, the aspect ratio is generally square panels. Um, I believe they did that um, on the edge of the panel. That's typically not what we would do here in North America. So I'm not exactly sure. I never did get an answer actually about why they did that on the edge. Um, Cause normally they would have, um, I guess it's considered their shoulder, but um, generally the aspect ratio is the same as what we would recommend for any concrete pavement, you know, the one to 1 1.5 max. Um, but generally with a TCP system, we're keeping our panels very square. Let me show you. So you can see um, even on, where's the one around the corners? Um, even around corners, um, you know, we're trying to keep within that uh, 1 to 1.5 max. Um, so we're following the exact same recommendations when it comes to the system as we would with any other system. Okay. We've got a, just a few minutes for a, a few more questions. Um, let's see. It looks like there's a couple in the chat. We'll see. No, those are from the... All right. And then here's a question. It says, any attempts to use the system on airport runways? Oh, good question. Um, we have not used this on any airport runways. Um, we have used it, though. Um, you'll notice on the users, um, we have used it with the U.S. Army um, and um, the Air Force. We've done some roadways where it has heavy military equipment on it, but we have not done any military or um regular runways yet but i don't see why we couldn't um mainly taxiways i think would be where we would have used it now um but sorry no i i don't uh, we haven't had any experience on a runway yet okay i uh, really appreciate uh, you sharing your your willingness to to educate us this morning <laughs> all right thank you